would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia. The University of Sydney stands on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are on, and pay respects to their elders past, present, and future. Jointly presented by the United States Study Center and NATO Public Diplomacy Division, this event is the latest in a series of talks with USSC and NATO experts in which we explore the challenges ahead of NATO and Australia and propose areas where furthering and deepening cooperation can offer solutions. Today on the agenda are the outcomes of the most recent NATO summit, and we couldn't have asked for a better interlock interlocutor than Mr. James Mackey. James Mackey is the Director of Security Policy and Partnerships in the Political Affairs and Security Policy Division at NATO Headquarters. In this capacity, he is responsible for overseeing NATO's political relationships with allies, partner countries, and other international organizations. During his 17-year career with NATO, James has held a vi wide variety of positions focusing primarily on NATO's political dialogue and practical cooperation with partner countries. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get underway. Your camera, microphone, chat function uh, have all been disabled so that we can have an uninterrupted discussion. But this by no mean, means means that we don't want you to participate. So we do encourage you to ask questions and this can be done at any time uh, by typing them into the Q&A function you'll see on your screens. You can ask questions and a selection of them will be answered during the Q&A session towards the end of the hour, uh, which is how long our discussion will go on for. Apart from being streamed live, the discussion is being recorded for later access on our YouTube channel. So just by way of a quick introduction into the topic, um, so just a little uh, over two years ago in April of 2019, uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization marked its 70th anniversary. At that point, NATO faced serious and complex challenges to its purpose, unity, and even its existence. Challenges were coming from within NATO, from beyond NATO's borders, there were challenges looming on the horizon, but at the summit that took place just a little over two weeks ago in Brussels, NATO officials were keen to draw a line under the troubled few years behind us when US President Donald Trump berated some allies for low defense spending and French President Emmanuel Macron even declared the alliance was experiencing brain death. But Perhaps the biggest news for those of us who are uh, watching at all of these developments from Australia and the broader Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific, uh, was NATO leaders' warning that China presents systemic challenges. This is indeed the wording in the communique that was published at the summit's conclusion, and it came a day after the G7 uh, nations issued a statement on human rights in China and Taiwan. But there was plenty more on the agenda. NATO's role in the changing geostrategic environment, collective defense, emerging technologies, climate change, security, and many other issues. So who better to ask for a bit of a scoop and, and a wash up of what went on um, than James Mackey. Um, the floor is all yours and uh, swiftly after we'll get into a discussion and Q&A. Karana, great. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone t tuning in from Australia. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to speak to you a little bit about sort of the outcomes of, of the recent summit. And, and as you said, Gorana, it was a, a big one for us. Uh, it was quite a lot of change. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll try and sort of briefly go through some of the key elements of the summit, talk a little bit about NATO overall, and then some of the key elements of the summit. And then where do we go from here? How are we looking forward? And I'll try at the end to touch a little bit on what does this mean for NATO Australia relations. So first of all, NATO, I imagine most of you already have a pretty good understanding, uh, a defensive alliance of 30 member states uh, focused on uh, making sure that we defend the security of those allies. It's a consensus-based organization, which doesn't always make decisions easy. Uh, but once we do take those decisions, we hope that they remain solid. Uh, we, it's, it's no secret that we had a difficult couple of years over the past few years with uh, the previous U.S. administration. And so really, I would say the key element of this, uh, this summit that we just had now 
uh, was a focus on reestablishing transatlantic ties. And uh, the US really wanted to demonstrate strongly the US commitment to the alliance, and I think more broadly to its treaty obligations and multilateral commitments more generally. And so I would say if there was sort of one overarching theme of the summit, that was it. Uh, and I think for that reason, this summit at NATO at least was watched quite closely in, in many different corners of the globe. Uh, to sort of try and understand how is the new U.S. administration going to engage with the world. And President Biden made quite clear that, you know, his first trip abroad was to try and shore up uh, and, and uh, undo a little bit of the damage that had been done uh, to our alliances over the past few years. Um, it being a NATO summit, uh, we had a communique which lays out in 78 paragraphs, I believe, 78 paragraphs, 79 paragraphs, excuse me. Uh, we never have short communiques at NATO. Uh, lays out in 79 paragraphs sort of the key areas uh, or the key policies that NATO believes it's engaged in. Um, I won't bore you by going through all 79 paragraphs of it. Uh, I, uh, you're happy to read it if you want. Uh, I think there may only be five of us at NATO headquarters who have read the whole thing. Uh, but let me give you the highlights. Um, I think that there was a recommitment really to the three core principles of the alliance that stem from our previous uh, strategic uh, concept. And it's really sort of what are the three missions of NATO? Uh, the first is collective defense. Everyone sort of knows that about NATO, an attack on one equals an attack on all. The second is crisis management. Uh, we need to be able to work collectively as an alliance and with our partner countries to tackle crises uh, wherever they're going to impact our security. And the third core principle or the third pillar of the alliance is uh, cooperative security. And that means working together with non-member countries to address the security challenges that we commonly face. Now those three core principles were reaffirmed, but of course the world continues to change and the security challenges that we face change. And so the, the leaders took a number of decisions at this summit uh, to try and set NATO up for the next 10 years and make sure that it remains relevant. Now, a lot of folks sort of say, well, NATO is a, a, uh, uh, it's an organization of the Cold War and um, you know, is it still serving its purpose? Well, I would argue, I'm a little biased, uh, but I would argue that NATO has changed and evolved with the world since the end of the Cold War. It's undergone several different transformations. And so this iteration that we're beginning now is just a continuation of that evolution that we've had over the last 25 or 30 years. And so what are some of the things that we are looking at? Um, these will be were mainly encapsulated in a series of decisions called NATO 2030, uh, which we've been engaged in over a process that we've been engaged in over the last year or so to try and think about is NATO ready for the challenges we see coming towards us. And so one of the key elements of that was to talk about how do we reinforce our political consultations on security challenges. Um, NATO is not seeking to replace the United Nations. Uh, the UN will remain the forum for global security discussions. But for our 30 allies, NATO remains the, the first place that they go to talk about their security concerns and to begin coordination of their security activities together. And so we were discussing a number of ideas about how can we reinforce that consultation mechanism and make sure that we're talking about the newest and most relevant challenges like cyber defense, uh, like emerging and disruptive technologies, like the challenge of military activity in space. And so uh, those are all areas that uh, we're looking at in terms of how NATO can serve as a platform for discussion among its allies. There was also a very strong look within the 2030 process for NATO's deterrence and defense mission. I mentioned we're a defensive alliance, um, but we also believe that deterrence is a key part of defense. Uh, you need to be strong in order to make sure that you are safe and secure. Uh, and so we had to sort of take stock of a number of the changes we've made over the last several years to ensure that our alliance remains strong. Are we able to work together? Um, do we have things like the ability to move our forces and equipment where it needs to go? Do we have the communications infrastructure to make sure that we can operate together when we need to? A third key area that we really focused on uh, in the, the summit was resilience. 
Uh, I think all of our societies have understood that some of the increasing challenges we've faced from disinformation, uh, cyber attacks, uh, a lot of the malware that has been going around, um, it, it really uh, ransomware attacks. Um, we need to really look and, and make sure that our societies are resilient against those types of changes. Uh, and NATO serves as a platform for all of our allies to talk about things like best practices. Now, in many cases, NATO won't necessarily be the primary actor because it's a national responsibility, or in a lot of cases, actually, the European Union here in Europe has responsibility for many of these systems like communications or Internet. Um, but the NATO allies have an obligation to make sure they can fulfill uh, their responsibilities to the organization. So we talked about a number of new requirements we're going to be setting for our allies to make sure that they keep their national resilience and they're able to uphold their commitments to the organization. Another big area that we talked about was uh, maintaining our technological edge. Uh, I think that we are faced with a huge number of challenges. Uh, NATO's mainly focused on the defense side of these issues. So uh, we're looking at, you know, how does how do cyber attacks affect our military infrastructure and our ability to work together? Um, but we're also looking, as I mentioned earlier, at things like the defense activity and militarization of space uh, and other emerging and disruptive technologies. Uh, like drone swarms, hypersonic glide vehicles, some of the new missile systems that are coming online. Um, we need to make sure that we as an alliance stay together and, and work on these challenges together. So we took a number of steps, uh, including starting up um, a venture capital fund to look at new technologies. Uh, we've created a new platform for allies to work together so they can pool their resources to try and look at new and, and different uh, technologies that can help the Alliance maintain its security. And so uh, it's while while this is a huge field emerging and disruptive technologies, we, we need to uh, make sure that we collectively work together to try and address them. And we are in fact at 30 stronger than we are separated because uh, a lot of the smaller allies can then pool their resources, pool their, their insight and expertise to be able to focus on things that will help the alliance as a whole. And just to give one example of you know, how that works in practice, uh, our colleagues in the Czech Republic uh, really have some of the best uh, forces when it comes to uh, chemical, biological, and radiological uh, weapons and uh, how to protect our troops against those types of attacks. And so uh, our Czech colleagues have actually focused on that particular area. They have that kind of expertise. And so within the alliance, we're beginning to see an increased specialization of forces so that everyone contributes something meaningful, you know, and that those Czech forces are really sort of top notch within the alliance in terms of handling that type of an issue. Um, another area that I think is important to look at in the NATO 2030 process is uh, working with our partners and looking at how do we build capacity in partner countries where they're struggling with their security situation. Uh, we've done this for many years in Afghanistan. Uh, we're doing it increasingly in Iraq, but throughout the Southeast Europe and the Middle East and North Africa, we have a whole series of programs that focus on capacity building. And uh, that's really a recognition of the fact that unless our partner countries are safe, uh, NATO, in fact, will not be safe. Uh, it's it's totally selfish on our part. Uh, we're doing it because we believe that it enhances our security. But as a benefit, it also enhances the security of our partner countries. So we work hand in hand with them. And, and what we're trying to look at there is, uh, are the tools we have right now the right ones to build capacity? And are they, uh, do we have the resources in place that are necessary to meet those challenges? So when we look at something like cyber defense or counterterrorism, the, the need always outstrips, uh, or yeah, the need always outstrips the resources. And so we've got to take a careful look to make sure that we're resourced uh, according to that way. And then last, I would sort of mention uh, what allies said um, in terms of uh, the future of the alliance. And uh, they talked about the need for a new strategic concept or an updated strategic concept. Uh, this is the document that sort of lays out the basis for NATO activity for the coming decade. The last one that we developed was in 2010. Uh, and so we hope by next spring, uh, we'll, we'll have uh, a new strategic concept agreed by the allies that will lay out uh, NATO's activities for the following 10 years. Um, 
A couple of other things that weren't necessarily part of our forward-looking process, but which I think are important to mention, and, and Gorana, you mentioned it also, I, I do need to, to talk about China because I think that's relevant, uh, certainly for an audience uh, in Australia. Um, let me begin by saying that NATO uh, has identified and, and continues to identify only two key threats to alliance security, and those threats are Russia and terrorism. Uh, and those remain the threats to alliance security, and it's based on uh, the actions and activity that we've seen in, in our region. Um, but you also mentioned that China certainly is identified as a challenge to our security. I think it's worth talking a little bit about what that means, and I can get into more detail in the question and answer period. But in terms of a challenge to our security, what it means is we see China's growing power on the world stage. And in fact, it's not NATO going towards China, it's China coming towards NATO. So we see China um, purchasing critical infrastructure uh, in our region. Uh, China has engaged in a number of military exercises with Russia in the Baltic Sea, the Mediterranean. China is increasingly active in the Arctic Sea. Uh, China has increased its nuclear and uh, its missile capabilities across a whole range of areas. Um, and in many cases, China is pushing up against and challenging international norms and international law. And we really see that as a challenge to our security in some ways. Uh, it does not mean we see China as an adversary, uh, but it means we need to take account of this change to the, um, the, the environment in which we find ourselves. And we need to understand what that means for NATO's security. We also clearly see opportunities to engage with China. And you'll see that there's one paragraph that talks about some of the challenges we face and another paragraph that talks about some of the uh, engagement opportunities. Um, we have a number of areas where we are already speaking to our Chinese colleagues. Uh, for instance, the security situation in Afghanistan. Um, we are talking to them also about UN peacekeeping operations, where all of us have a shared interest in making sure the UN has effective peacekeeping forces. Uh, and we're, we're looking in the future at things like, can we talk to China about climate change and security? Uh, and can we talk to China about possibly arms control uh, in the future? Uh, because uh, we do believe that as China's power grows on the world stage, we need to begin to talk about global norms and standards for arms control, which will keep all of us safer. Um, so all in all, uh, as I said, you know, that's a very brief overview of uh, 79 paragraphs and uh, more than a year of work. Uh, but hopefully that gives you sort of a broad sense of some of the key challenges uh, that we, we took up in the, in the summit. And then uh, I look forward to a, a good discussion. I saw there were already some good questions that had come in and I uh, look forward to a good conversation today. Thanks, Karana. Excellent. Thank you, James. Um, and certainly if you want to look at the uh, communique, definitely print it uh, both sides, I would say, uh, to save some paper. Um, so yeah, uh, so all 79 paragraphs are there. Uh, you did provide an excellent overview and, and uh, there is indeed a lot of fodder for, for discussion for us here. And I do actually want to start with this question of China uh, given that uh, <clears throat> the, the communique includes quite a robust section on China, which is definitely a, a change from just a couple of years ago. Uh, what struck me was more the kind of coverage that we heard um, in the lead up and around the summit where um, it's uh, not necessarily a kind of, there, there is a consensus obviously because it's in the communique, but uh, when you hear leaders from different countries talking about China, you do see some daylight in terms of the approach, right? Um, and um, while they are all on, on the whole concerned about, as you said, China's military aggression in disputed territories or just uh, military and technological uh, buildup by and large, we had a uh, French president who I've already mentioned, so now uh, a frequent appearance in our webinar saying that uh, the, the North Atlantic uh, organization is focused on this particular space. China has nothing to do with this particular geographic area. Uh, also, um, uh, the German chancellor who is outgoing has uh, maybe shied from, from making such uh, kind of uh, uh, clear and unequivocal uh, criticisms as we've heard, for instance, from the new uh, US administration. So just to, to kind of uh, shorten this question and uh, basically ask you for 
for uh, the, the, the kind of road uh, forward. Uh, it's well and good, obviously, to have a communique. And as you said, there is a st strategic concept in the making. But what to make of this institutional balance of power? To what extent will it hinder or help finding those areas of what you both said are opportunities to work with China, right? And also to draw clear lines where uh, the, the chosen approach and foreign policies uh, of the PRC are in dissonance and diverge from NATO's uh, goals and objectives. Thanks, Karana. Yeah, that's the big question we've all been facing. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good one and uh, asked uh, in many places uh, inside this headquarters as well. I, I think I would first say that we're an alliance of 30 democracies. And so you are going to have differences of opinion uh, within any 30 uh, democracies. Uh, that, that is by almost by definition what democracy is, is difference of opinion. Uh, even between, for instance, Australia and its closest neighbor, New Zealand, uh, you can see some difference of opinion in, in how to deal with China and how to, to work with China uh, and, and what is the perceived level of challenge and, and in different areas. So you can imagine if even between Australia and New Zealand, there's some daylight or divergence between 30 democracies, uh, it, it multiplies even more. I, I don't think that anyone is, is trying to say that China presents a threat to NATO. Um, we are a North Atlantic organization and, and we will continue to remain a North Atlantic organization. And NATO is certainly not seeking to become a global organization. Uh, and, and in terms of security in East Asia and Southeast Asia, there are existing formats uh, that probably serve the, that, that serve the security purposes well enough. And uh, it's not certainly NATO's intention to be there, but I, I would disagree with the French president a little bit in that, uh, as I said, you know, chi we see China increasingly coming towards us and, and being increasingly active in our region. And so it doesn't mean that it's a threat. It means we need to understand that. What does it mean for us? Um, the fact that China now controls some critical infrastructure that we actually depend on in order to use for our troop movements. Um, what does that mean for us? Uh, the fact that we see increasing disinformation, which actually doesn't respect borders, the, the disinformation that came out that we saw during um, the coronavirus pandemic um, actually was global in nature. It didn't sort of wasn't within region or within specific states. And so we just need to understand what that means uh, for us. Uh, it doesn't mean even necessarily that we will take action in all areas, but it's, it's to have an understanding and to reassure ourselves that we have the capability and the tools to be able to deal with those challenges. Um, I, no one is trying to contain China. Uh, it, China's rise is uh, its right as an international state uh, to be able to develop itself and to take its rightful place in the global order. Um, but I think what we're pushing for and what we're trying, that's why we're trying to engage with China, is to talk about uh, how we can jointly work towards international stability and security and the global rules and norms and international law, which has, have preserved uh, safety and peace for 70 years. So uh, we, we think that uh, as China grows in power and, and uh, it, it increases its ability to act internationally, that certain responsibilities come with that power. And uh, we believe that China has very much benefited from the existing international norms and the in international system. And therefore, China should have a stake in working with us to be able to talk about uh, how we preserve that system. And, and if China feels that system needs to be changed, then we need to have a discussion about it. Uh, we shouldn't be engaged in unilateral activities that try and upend international norms that have preserved peace, like I said, for 70 years and prevented great power conflict. So uh, you're always going to see a divergence of opinion, but I think there's certainly, I, I don't want to downplay the opportunities. You know, we really do see uh, a lot of uh, ways in which we can and should engage with China. Uh, each and every country in the world now also has an economic relationship with China. Uh, I think that's a great thing uh, because I think what it does is it gives everyone an incentive to, to engage in dialogue. Um, it reduces the temperature on things. Uh, but I do think that w a number of the challenges we face coming up, and I mentioned things like de defense and military activity in space. Uh, I didn't mention yet, but they're very important autonomous weapon systems and the use of artificial intelligence in warfare. 
um, some of the new technologies like hypersonic glide vehicles and new missile systems. Um, these are things that are going to challenge all of our security. And we really need to begin to have a dialogue on those so we talk about norms, standards, and eventually talk about arms control uh, arrangements uh, that can allow all of us to live safely uh, with these new challenges we face. So it's not an easy question. Uh, it's it's uh, something we're going to deal with, but it's something NATO has done a lot of work on internally over the last couple of years. Uh, we've certainly benefited from the insights that our Asia Pacific partners have brought to the table. Uh, we have uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and Republic of Korea are, are close partners of the alliance. And, and so we've really benefited from their insights about what is happening in their region. Uh, but on the understanding that NATO is going to remain a North Atlantic organization, we're a regional security organization, and we're not seeking a mandate for wider activity. But we do want to be an organization that has global connections and that understands the global security situation, because that will always have an impact on our security in our region. So thanks, so back over to you. Great, um, so that's uh, leading us uh, uh, really nicely into the next question. And uh, thank you all for posing your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, we've, we've been having uh, some uh, uh, questions uh, that have been coming in as James was speaking. So please do uh, pose them in the Q&A box and, and I'll get to them. And actually um, this one, uh, we, we have a couple of questions from Samuel Turin. Uh, thank you for posing uh, your questions around then the focus of NATO from uh, what you, James, just said in this debate of uh, stay at home or glo go global. It seems that there is the, the kind of orientation is to focus on the North Atlantic area, but understand that the challenges emanate from all around the world, basically. And this is uh, the, the kind of nature of the geostrategic environment that we have uh, in, in present day. But this leads me to the question then um, with, with these global challenges, and you also mentioned that there is the, the importance of, you know, being able to respond uh, or being able to actually preempt through um, uh, deterrence as well. And um, the, the kind of question that from the academic perspective always comes up in um, basically preparing oneself for, for these global challenges um, how do you deter without escalating? How do you deter without creating these security dilemmas for these uh, other other uh, uh, parties and actors? Um, I mean, I know that this is a very sort of, you know, essay type and, and kind of academic question, but I am looking, I, I'm, I mean, I'm interested in, in your take on that because certainly, you know, if you are sitting in Beijing, then the perspective of, of, of NATO, you know, strengthening partnerships around Asia or Indo-Pacific, right, um, is something that uh, might be perceived as some sort of uh, encroachment of sorts, right? This is certainly the language we've heard uh, from, from Russia um, in, in previous years in, in the context of enlargement. So um, any, any part of this to, to respond to? Thanks. Yeah. I mean, the way that I would say, how do you deter without escalating? I think you do it through dialogue and engagement. Um, and I think that what you do is, you know, you, you uh, are responsible as a, as a state and we are responsible as an alliance for uh, ensuring that we have adequate defense. Okay, but how do you then prevent that actions that you take in your own defense from creating a, uh, an escalation ladder? And I think you do that through dialogue uh, and transparency. And we had a number of arms control regimes, uh, architectures in Europe, which worked quite well over many, many decades uh, to prevent great power conflict. Um, you know, the fact that there was, in fact, no conflict in the Cold War is nothing short of a miracle, given the, the amount of armament on both sides and given um, the ideological conflict between the two sides, uh, the opportunity for misunderstanding, the flashpoints that we had like Berlin and, and other parts of the Eastern Bloc. Um, but the fact that we didn't uh, have a conflict, I think, is really down to the fact that there was dialogue 
and we had uh, transparency. And transparency was ensured through arms control arrangements. Now, unfortunately, Russia has walked away from all of those, almost all of those arms control arrangements. Uh, in particular, the one that's the most worrying for us is Russia's violation of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Um, so what that means right now is that Russia has deployed missiles to the Kaliningrad region, which are dual capable, uh, can be conventional or nuclear, uh, which can strike a, a NATO, some NATO capitals in about four to five minutes. Uh, so we'd have about four to five minutes of lead time to decide whether a nuclear strike was coming in or not. That kind of thing is inherently destabilizing uh, and it leads to escalation uh, and it, it forces us to take actions in order to make sure our defenses are, are secure, but that leads to a higher level of tension. And so um, I, that's why we're constantly trying to talk to our Russian colleagues about the need to re-engage seriously uh, in arms control discussions uh, and also to engage with us in, in dialogue on a regular basis, which unfortunately they, they haven't really been willing to do. Um, but I guess to turn this towards the sort of the Indo-Pacific region, um, I think what I would say is um, that, you know, NATO is, you will not see NATO exercises uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, you will certainly not see NATO bases in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, what, you, what you may see is NATO trying to reach out to a set of global partners to try and understand uh, the situation uh, in the region and to understand the challenges that our partners are facing. Um, we, I guess the best way to think about where we're trying to position NATO or where we think NATO adds value is NATO really is sort of a hub for expertise on defense and security issues. We've got 30 member states. We've got 40 partner countries, 40 countries that have a formal partnership arrangement with us. And we have another 15 or 20 countries who work with us on an ad hoc basis. So you're talking there, you know, upwards of 85 countries or 90 countries uh, who come together to talk about security challenges. And so when we're talking about things like norms and standards for autonomous weapon systems, uh, we think that NATO provides a really good platform for discussion and dialogue on that. Now, eventually, we'll have to move towards international treaties and, and arms control arrangements, um, and that will likely be done in the United Nations. But a lot of the preparatory work can be done in, in other useful fora like that. And, and I think, as I said, NATO provides that useful forum. And, and we think it's in our interest to engage and work with our partners in the region. Uh, they are sovereign states. Uh, they get to decide their own security arrangements. Uh, and I didn't, I apologize because I didn't get to the NATO Australia relationship uh, in my initial remarks. I'm happy to talk about that next. But just to sort of say, you know, the, the basis of the relationship between NATO and Australia is that we can learn a lot from each other. Australia brings real capabilities and insight to the table, and Australia benefits uh, from the capabilities and insight of NATO. Uh, we also are clear about the fact that NATO and Australia want to be able to work together when we need to. Uh, who would have thought that we would have come together in Afghanistan more than 20 years ago? Uh, and um, the fact is we learned a lot of hard lessons about how uh, we weren't necessarily able to work together efficiently. Uh, through that mission. But over time, we worked through all of those issues. And the point is to try and ensure that in the future, we can work together when we want to work together. And in the meantime, we need to talk about the challenges we're facing and try and figure out what's best for each of us. But like I would say, at, at the end of the day, uh, our partners are sovereign countries. Uh, they can decide with whom they cooperate and, and how they cooperate. Uh, we're not sort of twisting anybody's arm or, or forcing them into talking to us. Perfect. So um, if I was to write a, a kind of, you know, a bombastic article uh, from, from kind of the takeaways, uh, it would be that NATO is certainly not uh, a, a planning on building any sort of bases and uh, there is no kind of uh, vision of, of uh, that kind of presence, but there is certainly a lot of NATO member states that are increasingly thinking about the Indo-Pacific as a region where they need to be more active, right? And this comes basically over the past uh, 
couple of years, we had France being a kind of first mover, at least in terms of obviously the United States adopting the free and open Indo-Pacific. We are the US study center. So I've kind of take some of these things as, as already assumed knowledge, but in terms of the European states, which obviously uh, uh, don't have that, that kind of reach, um, France was the first one with the defense paper in 2018 and then kind of uh, further articulations over the past two years. And then we had Germany, we had the Netherlands, we just had uh, the UK publish their strategic review where there is the talk of the Indo-Pacific tilt. Um, so would you say then in that context, um, would NATO be filling in the gaps where um, the member states are uh, kind of driving some of the, the specific and especially in terms of the, the kind of military policy, the specific policies? Sure. Well, there clearly, as you mentioned, you know, there are clearly uh, a number of allies who are active in the security sphere in the Indo-Pacific, and uh, that's because uh, several of them are Indo-Pacific countries. Uh, and so it's quite natural that they would actually be part of the security arrangements and would be active there. There are also a number of treaty obligations uh, that some of our allies have uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. And so they obviously need to uphold those treaty obligations. So it's perfectly normal that, that they, would, uh, they would do that. Now, what, does, what role does NATO play in this? Well, it's clear that our treaty covers the North Atlantic region. So uh, an attack um, in another region wouldn't necessarily fall under the treaty obligations of the Washington Treaty. Um, but it's pretty difficult to divorce uh, your security, to sort of say, okay, one part of our security is over here and another part of our security is over here. So if increasingly ch increasing challenges to security in the Indo-Pacific are um, important to some of our allies, then we need to understand what their security preoccupation is. Just as you know, many of our southern allies uh, are focused on the challenge coming from uh, the Sahel and the North Africa region, uh, you know, human trafficking and trafficking in small arms and light weapons and and terrorism. Um, so we we need to be focused on the the challenges that are important to our allies. But that doesn't necessarily mean NATO will be active there. You know, we would have to, at the end of the day, get consensus among our 30 allies for NATO to take action in the region. Uh, and I don't know that we would ever get that kind of consensus, uh, just because, as I said, many allies feel we need to remain true to the North Atlantic region. But I do think that NATO can and should help where it can in the Indo-Pacific region, but also NATO can benefit from what's developing in the Indo-Pacific region. And just to give an example, um, ASEAN is talking right now about uh, international code of conduct with regard to maritime activities. Um, and how do you have confidence in security building measures and how do you move eventually towards arms control arrangements or transparency arrangements. NATO has 60 years plus of experience of doing confidence in security building measures, arms control inspections, transparency measures. Uh, and so it, to me, it's, it's quite natural that NATO would want to reach out to ASEAN and other actors in the region to talk about experience, lessons learned. Uh, and I think that ASEAN is having to deal, for instance, with some of the newer technologies and new security challenges. And we can certainly learn from ASEAN uh, about sort of their experience. What are the key elements they have found the most difficult to, to understand or to regulate, to, to talk about? And so sharing of information allows us to, I think, all benefit. Uh, another example that I would give uh, is uh, this one related to New Zealand, for instance. Um, New Zealand has an entire strategy now for uh, defense and security related to climate change. Uh, and so it's talking about how its forces need to evolve, how its military doctrine needs to evolve, the kinds of partnerships that it needs to establish in order to deal with the consequences of climate change. Uh, and it's very forward looking. I would say there's several years ahead of most of the world in terms of thinking seriously about this. And this is because of the close relationship that New Zealand has with many of its neighbors in the South Pacific. Uh, and so it understands they are immediately impacted by climate change and it has real security implications for them. Uh, and so you know, we're benefiting, NATO is benefiting from New Zealand's expertise in this area. And as we develop our own policy on climate change and security, we're trying to learn from our partner in the region uh, who has a lot of experience in this. And so I think at the end of the day, it's, it's about mostly about sharing information, 
but also a little bit about talking about how we uphold international rules and norms. Because when rules and norms and international law is challenged in one part of the world, uh, it weakens it elsewhere. Um, when uh, Russia invaded Crimea and annexed Crimea, one of the first countries to come out with a statement uh, against this was Australia. Uh, and one of the first countries that actually contacted NATO to talk about this was Australia. And it's because Australia recognized that that uh, a violation of, of Ukraine's sovereign territory, uh, Ukraine's territorial integrity, was a challenge to territorial integrity everywhere. Uh, and so we need to understand this and be able to coordinate on these types of challenges. That's excellent. And um, I will use my uh, uh, di discussants or, or chair's prerogative uh, for just one more question before we actually start addressing the multiple questions we've gotten in, in the Q&A uh, box. So um, your last point uh, on, on partners, learning from them and, and working from them uh, brings us to the, uh, you already mentioned in your opening remarks, this initiative around NATO 2030 of Alliance being more militarily prepared, but also becoming more political and more global, right? And you do, did make a point of saying that partner states are sovereign states, right? They have formalized bilateral agreements with NATO, but they have an independent policy uh, uh, nonetheless, um, though with obviously entering such partnerships they do do send a signal out there. Um, so this was also one of the questions that was submitted uh, in the lead up to our, our webinar around partnerships moving forward. And obviously, I'm just asking you to speculate here and, and read the tea leaves, but where do you see partnerships going? You already mentioned uh, the, the kind of space where uh, we can learn from one another. And I'm just going to use my dual heads here because I'm a dual citizen of both Australia and a, and a NATO member state. But uh, what is it that, that they can learn from each other? And where is it that you see potentially this cooperation being furthered or maybe even expanded to include other countries. I know that, you know, sometimes in these discussions, India's and Indonesia's of the world sometimes even pop up. Um, your thoughts. Thanks. Um, I, you know, it's funny because we've actually, we've been doing this already. And I think w this discussion within the, the, the summit and the NATO 2030 process is almost sort of catching the policy up with the practice. Uh, because we've, we've been doing this for a while. A good example that I give uh, is, uh, I think it was probably about eight or nine years ago, where NATO had a meeting to talk about counter piracy off the east coast of Africa. And we had 70 countries, seven zero countries participating in that meeting, including China and India. Uh, for the first time ever, actually, in a formal NATO meeting. Uh, this is, you know, I, I know it's only eight years ago, but that, that's uh, eons of time in, in NATO speak. And the reason they participated, because they felt there was value for them there. Uh, they felt that there was something interesting that they could talk about, because all of us were very concerned about piracy off the east coast of Africa. And so it was a it was a good meeting. We talked about best practices. We talked about deconflicting the different missions that were active there. Uh, in that space and uh, making sure that that we were able to work effectively together and increasingly that sort of where I see these kinds of discussions in the future. I don't think that NATO necessarily is going to push for a formal partnership with every single country that comes to us. Some countries just won't want that. It's, it's up to them to decide. Um, some countries just want to work with us on a case by case basis. Um, just another example, uh, it's we don't it's not very um, very widely publicized, but NATO probably does about 15 or 20 activities per year with Singapore. Uh, and Singapore is not a formal partner of the alliance, but Singapore has a very advanced defense forces. Uh, and Singapore in particular is very interested in scientific cooperation with NATO. Uh, and so uh, we look at things like military medicine at sea. Uh, we look at ensuring robust communications with our, our naval forces. Uh, and so uh, that that is just something Singapore has approached us and has sort of said, okay, what is what's on offer? Uh, and then on a case by case ba basis, NATO and Singapore decide to engage with each other. The same you can say for uh, countries like Tanzania, um, 
uh, Kenya, uh, South Africa, Brazil, uh, all of those countries have engaged with us on, on, in a case by case basis without having sort of a formal arrangement uh, uh, with a big set of activities. And so we're, we're fine with that. Uh, you know, we, we think if countries only want to have a case by case uh, arrangement, then that's fine. But, but for us, what we want to do is we want to uh, use, as I said, NATO as that platform for dialogue and discussion, because we have a critical mass here of people who know about these things, people who are thinking deeply about what these security changes mean for us. And so we think there's value to, to have. Um, and in terms of, you know, just to make it very specific to Australia, um, we, this, it's very likely that, like, for instance, with Australia, we will be talking to Australia about satellite capabilities and defense of satellites and uh, how are we going to ensure that our space capabilities remain safe uh, during a crisis or during a conflict? Uh, at the same time, we also want to be having, and, and we can only hold that in a very classified setting with, with Australia, um, but at the same time, we also want to be talking in a much wider group of countries about what are the norms and standards and confidence building measures that we need to see so that we're safer. Uh, and so a country that where we have a very deep relationship and a very deep level of trust, like Australia, um, needs to be involved in both of those discussions. But maybe a country like India um, only wants to participate in the, the broader discussion about norms and confidence building measures because India itself is, is also active in space. So um, I, I don't really have a set list of countries we'd like to see. Uh, it's pretty much anybody who wants to. Uh, and also, to be honest, any regional organization that wants to. You know, we engage deeply with the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, the African Union. Um, we're looking at possibly working a little bit more with ECOWAS. Uh, and so uh, the G5 Sahel, and, and so uh, NATO as a regional organization believes that we can also work hand in hand with other regional organizations as they address security challenges. Perfect. Uh, we are now getting to the last 10 -ish or, or less minutes of our conversation. And so I'm going to address uh, the questions that have been posed uh, and, and try to kind of uh, thread some sort of uh, a nice uh, a narrative to all of that. Um, so staying with the future, maybe, and some uh, um, questions have been posed uh, that uh, uh, are asking either about the future enlargement, so not partnerships, but here we are talking about uh, uh, growing beyond 30 member states, especially in the context of, say, uh, Georgia and Ukraine. This was a question from uh, our uh, senior or visiting fellow, that is Senator Stephen Loosley. And we had a, a question that went into the similar direction by Miriam Frommer, who is asking what it is that NATO could do in future uh, potential hypothetical uh, um, security crisis in uh, Ukraine. Um, so um, absorbing further territory um, and, and similar. So maybe let's take those two questions together um, and then we'll ad address the remaining ones. Sure, and I'll try and be quick. I know there's a lot of questions and I apologize if I went on too long earlier. Uh, it's, uh, but let's try and get to some of the questions. In terms of aspirant countries, uh, we currently have three countries that aspire to join the alliance. They are Ukraine, Georgia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, we believe, uh, and it's certainly in line with, uh, for instance, like the Helsinki Final Act, which created the, the OSCE or was the precursor of the OSCE, that states that every European state has the right to choose its own security arrangements. Uh, and that as sovereign states, they are allowed to do so. And so no third country has a droit de regard or, or has a veto over NATO enlargement. It's for NATO and the partner country to decide. Um, that having been said, Ukraine, Georgia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina understand that they still have work to do before they can become members of the alliance. We have standards that we set, we have obligations that they need to meet, they need to contribute to the security of our alliance, uh, and we work with them very intensively through what's called an annual national program. Uh, in the case of Georgia and Ukraine, it's called a reform program for Bosnia and Herzegovina to sort of go into really, really deep level of, of reforms uh, within their government across all sectors, because we're integrating the whole country and, and not just the armed forces. In terms of a future scenario where the, the security challenge of, uh, you know, the, the territorial integrity of Ukraine is further challenged, 
Um, I think that we would continue to do what we already have been doing, um, which we, NATO has more than 60 experts on the ground in Kiev advising the, the armed forces of Ukraine on its reform efforts. Uh, many allies on the basis of the NATO reforms, many allies have uh, been actually um, selling to Ukraine or, or giving to Ukraine defensive weapon systems so that it can defend itself. Uh, and Russia has uh, actually uh, been on the receiving end of some pretty significant sanctions. Uh, and uh, we know that they're, they're hitting Russia because Russia is constantly complaining about those sanctions. Um, and so those have an effect. And so if we saw further challenges to Ukrainian security, I think we would see increased defense support to Ukraine, but also increasing sanctions on Russia. Um, we don't like having sanctions on a country, but, but if a country is not living up to international norms, is not living up to international law and its international obligations, um, then, then we need to send a signal that, that we don't accept that. Um, Ukraine is not a member of the alliance, and so we do not have an Article 5 obligation to come to its defense, but we understand that Ukraine is a close partner and, and we're doing quite a lot already uh, to help the country through its reform path and, and to ensure it has adequate defense. Great. Question from Aston Kwok, who uh, was wondering about cybersecurity and um, how can NATO mount an effective response to an asymmetric nature of this threat, uh, and especially uh, the, the cyber crimes that are coming from state-sponsored actors. Um, so here specifically re re referring to Russia and, and China. So cyber defense is is extremely, extremely difficult challenge. I mean, obviously, we've even sort of seen, you know, a state like the United States, uh, which had the pipeline shut down recently, you know, e even um, one of the largest countries, uh, most powerful countries in the world is is uh, uh, vulnerable to these kinds of asymmetric threats. So I, I think we need to be clear about sort of where the responsibility lies. I mean, the first responsibility for cyber defense lies with each individual state. That's a, a basic um, uh, tenet of government. You know, you are responsible for the security of your people. Um, then I think um, we also have um, in Europe, at least the European Union, which has a, a coordinating function among its member states to talk about things like the internet more generally, uh, telecommunications more generally. And so the EU will also have a lot to say on this. Where NATO focuses on is cyber defense specifically for our defense and military systems. So can we make sure that our systems operate and can talk to each other in a crisis or in a war? And so NATO has sort of a very narrow focus. Now, the good thing about that is that if you have very strong measures there and you see good lessons there, a lot of times in the defense field, they apply much more broadly. The internet itself actually grew out of an effort by the US Defense Department uh, to, to ensure communications. And so a lot of times the advances you make on defense technology and defense activity uh, resonates out and, and benefits society more widely. And so uh, while NATO is focused on a very narrow scope or narrow area, just the defense systems and defense aspects, it's clear that this is a security challenge for whole of society and so we can't ignore it. The other thing that NATO can do again is act as that platform. We have 30 countries who have a wide variety of capabilities. We have 40 partners who join us. And so um, we think NATO provides, again, a really good platform for discussion of this. Anyone who's interested, I would, I would highly recommend you look, NATO has a cyber defense center of excellence based in Tallinn, Estonia. And most of the work they do is unclassified and uh, out, on, uh, out on the internet. So if you're interested in NATO's role in cyber defense and, and how NATO is tackling this challenge more generally, I would, I would recommend look up the Cyber Defense Center of Excellence in Tallinn, Estonia. Uh, they're doing some really, really interesting work there. That's excellent. There are two or three more questions, but I'm going to prioritize um, the, the maybe the, the bigger urgency in terms of what concerns a uh, whole of humanity and that's climate change. And you mentioned uh, that uh, already in your uh, reference to New Zealand's um, defense strategy. So um, there has obviously been a lot of discussion uh, around uh, the implications of climate change. And this question in particular posed by Samuel Turin asks about the opening of the Arctic passage and some of the other important shifts in the, uh, in the strategic environment. Uh, what role does NATO have to play and how does it adapt? How, do, how does it respond? 
Sure. I mean, there, there's two ways in which we're responding. And the first is much closer to home is we are, uh, based on the, the decisions taken at this summit, we are now going to um, look at methodologies. A number of them are already available, but we're going to look at the methodology that's, that's best suited for NATO and allies to assess the climate footprint of NATO and its activities and also NATO's military activities. Uh, so we first need to assess and then we can talk about how we can mitigate the climate impact uh, of NATO's activities and operations. That's at a very small level. I think every organization in the world needs to be doing that right now. Assess your, your climate footprint and begin to talk about mitigation measures. Then that's the, the within NATO thing. Then there's the much broader issue of how climate change is going to impact international global security in the years to come. And I think there is no one at this point who can argue that it will not have a significant impact. Um, you mentioned the opening of the Arctic. Um, that will clearly create a, a new space uh, for uh, human activity, hopefully mostly trade, uh, but we've already seen uh, Russia in particular take a number of steps to try and um, reassert itself militarily in the Arctic. Um, and so we will need to talk also about what does this mean for our security. And again, as we have norms and standards in places like the Baltic Sea, do we have to have similar types of norms and standards to ensure de-escalation, to ensure uh, there are no accidents uh, as we operate in that space? But I think really the thing even, I mean, the Arctic is, is certainly important. I don't want to downplay it. But I think the thing that is really going to hit us more and more is that climate change is going to increasingly exacerbate the ch security challenges we already see. So if we talk about um, water scarcity and food scarcity um, causing conflict, causing human migration, um, causing um, conflict within states but across state borders and, and even having an impact regionally, um, this is something that is going to hit all of our security. And, and as I said, you know, the reason New Zealand has been so focused on this is that it sees that many of its close partner states in the South Pacific are facing real security challenges, humanitarian challenges, uh, which sometimes can lead to conflict. And so we need to, uh, across all areas of NATO's work, we need to start to include um, climate assessments in all of our activities. How does climate change impact what's going to happen in the Sahel? How does climate change impact what's going to happen in, in the, the, the Gulf region? Um, because it will certainly have an impact on our, the types of missions we'll have to undertake, the, the threat that different societies face. Uh, I was just having a conversation with uh, the OECD uh, a few days ago about their updating their um, uh, their threat model for different countries around the world that look at the uh, the vulnerability of, of different states and climate they they were a front runner here climate has been a big part of uh, of their activity for a long time part of their assessments, but what they're seeing is actually that climate change is actually. Uh, exacerbating all of the other vulnerabilities within a society. It, it just makes everything much worse. And so uh, that is reason enough to, to make a serious effort uh, to, to, to deal and tackle with climate change. But it also means, at least in the short term, we need to think about what does it mean for our missions, our analysis, and, and the capabilities that we have. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, James. And we are just getting to the, the top of the hour here. So we will have to close here. Uh, there were some more questions that were as broad as, and as important as the kind of perennial question of whether Russia and China are allied or aligned and, you know, kind of how uh, we might see that uh, uh, relationship moving forward or as specific as, uh, you know, what's going to happen with the Kaliningrad district, whether it's a, re a viable part of Russia moving forward. But unfortunately, we don't have uh, time for that today. However, this uh, series of talks is uh, going to continue once uh, Europe is uh, done with its summer holidays and Australia emerges in springtime, I hope with some better news pandemic wise. So for all of you who have joined us, especially from Sydney and New South Wales, uh, I hope that you are all well and safe and that we at least uh, uh, well, killed some time, you know, in, in the two week uh, lockdown that you have at the moment, but that you also learned something and got something out of it. I for sure did. And I think uh, some of these takeaways about uh, future of NATO uh, resonate with just the history of NATO being a, an alliance that adapts 
constantly, right? Uh, but remains firmly a regional organization. That was at least the, the kind of note that I made to myself. Now, uh, I don't wish to, to keep you uh, online any longer. I would like to again thank James Mackey for joining us uh, this morning or afternoon, depending on uh, which part of the world you are. And for all of you who have joined us, thank you again. Have a good rest of the day. And I hope to see you at one of our future events. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you.